Okay, so this is the first in our series of learning to program. This is going to be an introduction of how to use the Arduino programming environment. In our previous segment, we went through how to install the Arduino software for use with Ringo. Your next step is going to be to open a browser window and visit plumgeek.com and slide down to the Getting Smart link. From there, let's slide down and download the Ringo Base Sketch. While we're here, I'll also point out the Ringo Educational Guide. If you haven't looked at it yet, please go ahead and download that and start reading through it. It basically takes you from the very beginning of how to use the, the code to control all of Ringo's uh, lights and sensors and that sort of thing. And that's pretty much where you're going to get your information on how to actually write your code. It should download to your Downloads folder. And then we're going to take the file that unzips and we're going to copy that. And we're going to go to the place where Arduino likes to store its sketch files. It's going to be in your Documents folder, or on Windows, it's My Documents, and it's the Arduino folder. We're going to start storing these sketches in the Software from PG folder. We'll copy it in there. So now you have Ringo Base Sketch. We're now going to launch Arduino. Give that a second to boot up. This is the default sketch that opens whenever you start Arduino, and it's the very bare basics that you, that you need to compile any sketch for an Arduino uh, type processor. We're not actually going to use this. We're going to open up what we call the base sketch. And the way you'll open that is you go to File, Sketchbook, Software from PG, which is that folder that we created earlier, and then you're going to go to Base Sketch. Go ahead and close out the other window. And take this window and expand it all the way out so you can see it better. Okay, so this is the Arduino programming environment. It's called the IDE, which stands for Integrated Development Environment. And this is where you're going to be writing all of your code for Ringo, or anything else you do with Arduino for that matter. So I want to give you a quick orientation of the window and what we have, and basically what we're looking at here. Normally when you're writing code for an Arduino platform, there's only one tab that opens up. And this one tab has all the code that we see on this one page here. For Ringo, we actually have some additional tabs here. And these are the supporting functions that run in the background if you call them. If you really want to investigate these files, you can look at the tabs. And also, for your information, if you go back inside this folder that we copied over and you look inside of it, you're going to see this INO file, which is Ringo Base Sketch 05 INO, which corresponds with this tab up here. And you'll notice that all these other tabs that are listed up here are these other files that are in the folder with you. So it actually stores them as individual files on your disk, but once it opens up, it opens up all the other files that are inside that folder, and it creates them as tabs up here inside Arduino. We'll talk more about the tabs in a little while. So let's get oriented with the uh, window itself. You have two really important buttons up here. There's the verify and the upload. You'll be using those a lot. There's also the serial monitor window over here, and we'll get to that in a later example. Now, the verify, when you click that, that causes Arduino to compile your software. And basically what that does is it goes through all your code and it compiles it and it turns it into machine language that can actually be loaded onto an Arduino processor or the Ringo robot in this case. You'll want to run that often because when you're making changes, if you make a mistake somewhere and you try to verify, it will uh, error out and it'll show you that there's something wrong with your code down here. The upload button does exactly what you think it does. When you plug in the Ringo robot through the programming adapter, you click the upload button and that recompiles your code and it uploads it onto the Ringo robot. With the most recent versions of the Arduino software, whenever you click verify or upload, it will also save any changes you've made in any of the tabs along the way. Now I'm going to assume for this tutorial that you are brand new to programming and that this is completely foreign to you. This window as a whole and all the software and all the comments that are written in it is called a sketch. And all these other tabs get used in the sketch also. So you could kind of consider the whole collection of all these tabs together a sketch. And that's something that Arduino kind of invented the name of as a sketch. Uh, but you could just say that it's source code or it's a code listing or anything like that. It's basically the same thing. This section at the top that's grayed out is what they call comments. Now, comments are useful for uh, leaving notes in your code. So these are uh, indications that kind of basically give you some instructions or they tell you something interesting. Uh, here in this case, it's the license for the Creative Commons. 
And down inside the code, you have comments that are at the end of the code, and those are useful for telling you what that code actually does. And so it's really important to comment your code. It helps, it helps other people to read it, and it helps you to understand what you did later on. Uh, this is really simple code. It only does a couple of things, but eventually when you write more complex functions, you're going to want to uh, comment your individual lines so that when you come back to them later on, you can understand what you were trying to do. Comments can be made one of two ways. You can have a comment block, which is an entire group of comments here, and that's started by this symbol up here. It's a forward slash with an asterisk. And then to end the code block, you're going to do an asterisk with a forward slash. Everything inside there is going to get commented out. And so this only appears as like a note for you in your source code. When it actually compiles this information to go onto the Ringo, it ignores everything that's, that's considered comments. So all this gray stuff, the compiler doesn't even see it. It just skips right over it. You can also leave a comment by placing two forward slashes on a given line. Everything before the forward slashes over here is considered code, and everything with the forward slashes and after it is considered a comment. Now this base sketch is basically a template. It's a, uh, a fully functioning sketch and it has all of the associated and supporting tabs already set up for you at the top and it's got the bare basic code that you really need in order to actually run something on the Ringo. So let's take a look at what that actually comprises right now. The first line you're going to see in here is this hashtag and include and then in quotes RingoHardware.h and if you'll notice there is a file up here called RingoHardware.h now, you don't need to know what's in that file right now, but just know that when, it, when the compiler comes across this, it's going to start from the top and move all the way down. And when it comes across this include, it's going to take RingoHardware.h, this tab right here, and it's going to kind of virtually paste it into your document right here just as it compiles it. Um, it won't actually paste it in here that you'll see, but as it's compiling, it's going to kind of grab it and stick it in there. And if you go look at RingoHardware.h, and you go down inside there, you'll see that there are some other includes here. This include tells it to include the Arduino header files, which is the standard, uh, basically what uh, the processor needs to, to be able to talk to its pins and that sort of thing. And uh, this is a header file that's not inside the sketch, it's actually deep inside the Arduino software itself. The next line tells it to include funstuff.h, which is right here, and navigation.h, which is right here. Uh, we'll talk about the H files later on. They're actually called header files, but suffice to say that by including RingoHardware.h, you're also including all the other things. So by adding that one line right there, you essentially compile in all these other tabs. It's also worth noting that the compiler is pretty smart, and it will only include functions on these other tabs that are actually used down here in your code. So there are, if you go into some of these other tabs, there are functions in there uh, that are, are, are quite long. And if you don't actually call any of those functions in your actual code out here, then it won't compile those in. So you're not really harming yourself in any way by having them there and available to you if you want them. Moving beyond the include, you see this first line, which is void setup. Now, forget about the void right now, just suffice to say that it needs to be there. And this setup with a parentheses is a function, and this is the setup function. And you see there's an opening curly brace here, and there's a closing curly brace down here. And you can see when I click near one, the other one is highlighted right here. That way you know that the two are associated with each other. So you have an opening curly brace and a closing curly brace. It's not important that it's on the same line. You could put the curly brace curly brace just down like this, but it's uh, customary the way you would normally write the code is to leave it up here. Inside the curly braces, you're going to see there's four lines of code here. Each one of these lines is what we call a function, and you know it's a function because it has parentheses at the end of it. And what this basically is going to tell Ringo to do is to go find a function called hardware begin, which is buried in one of these tabs over here. It's actually, actually over in the Ringo hardware tab. And it's going to do whatever that function tells it to do. And after it gets done running that function, it's going to come back here to the same spot in the code, and then it's going to go on to the next function, which is play start chirp. Now, hardware begin is important to have at the beginning of every one of your sketches. It should always be the first item inside your setup. And what hardware begin is going to do is it just goes around and it sets all of the pins uh, as necessary on the processor. Uh, so it sets the inputs to inputs and the outputs to outputs. And it basically just configures the processor in the correct orientation so that it can actually communicate with all the different parts of Ringo. The play start chirp is actually another, it's, it's another function in the same way. 
and the play start chirp is what causes that little chirpy sound and the, the eyes to blink blue when you first turn the power on. We'll get to that in a little while, but you can actually go in and edit play start chirp. That's actually one of the fun things that you could do when you're playing around with Ringo. Switch motors to serial. Um, that's a little more advanced, just suffice to say it should be in there. Uh, basically the motor control lines and the serial uh, data line, which goes to your serial monitor over here, are shared on Ringo. And whenever you run the motors, it will automatically uh, switch them to motor mode, but anytime you want to actually put out some kind of serial information through your serial monitor, you need to call this first. So we just go ahead and call it once and set up. Uh, the restart timer just resets a timer that runs in the background that you can pull during your code to do interesting things if it's timing oriented. So the setup function only runs once. As soon as you start up the processor, it's going to go and run through everything in your setup function. And once that's run one time, it's going to go to the next function in line, which is loop. So the next line down is loop. And loop does exactly what you think it does. It loops over and over and over. This is where you're going to put all of your code. If you're doing something rather simple, you can put it all inside here, and if you're doing things that are more complex, you can start to take some of the complex tasks, and you can break them out, and you can actually add more functions of your own that can be called from the loop function. That's another lesson for another day, but just suffice to say that pretty much all your code is going to go inside this loop function. And so the uh, parentheses say that it's a function, and the opening curly and the closing curly down here is what actually includes all the stuff inside the function. So everything between the opening curly and the closing curly is what's actually going to get run in this loop. So the base sketch has a really simple example already loaded up inside of it, so you can take a look at how it works. And what this does is it runs the onEyes function. The onEyes function turns on Ringo's eyes, and the way his eyes work is he actually has, inside each little eye, each one of the colored lights actually has a red, a green, and a blue element in it. And by turning them on different amounts of brightness, you can actually create any color. And so the way you control those colors is by passing it the three values, the value for red, the value for green, and the value for blue. And you can pass it a number between 0 and 255. So 0 means that element is turned completely off, and 255 means it's on full bright. Keep in mind that those LEDs are really bright and you really don't need to turn it up that high. Uh, usually values up in the 150 to 200 range are, are more than enough. Um, down around 100 to 150 are, are usually just fine. The idea with this sketch is that we want to turn the eyes on one color and then alternately turn them on to a different color. If we turn them on and then immediately change them to a different color, um, they would change between the two colors so quickly that you wouldn't be able to see it because this line of, of code uh, processes and the eyes update pretty much instantaneously. It, it's far faster than what your eyes can see. So what we do is we turn the eyes on and they're going to stay on until we tell them to either turn off or to change to a different color. So once they're on, the next line of code beyond that is going to be delay. And delay does what you think it does. It delays for a certain amount of time. And the delay is given in milliseconds. And there's a thousand milliseconds in every second. So if you tell it to delay by a thousand, then that means it's going to delay for one second. So you're going to turn the eyes on the first color, and then you're going to delay one second, and then you're going to turn the eyes on a different color. You notice in this case, we turn the red on 50, we turn the green off, and we turn the blue back on, or we leave the blue on. You would think that's all you need to do because it's going to loop right back up to the beginning, but considering that because it's going to loop, the end of this line of on eyes right here is basically uh, may as well be set right up on top of this first line right here because as soon as it runs this line, it's going to immediately run back up to the top and start all over again. So if we want to see the second color for any amount of time, we need to put another delay in right there. So basically, every time it goes through the loop, it's going to turn the eyes on one color and then it's going to wait for it for one second, and then it's going to turn the eyes on a second color, and then it's going to wait for a second, and then it's going to go back up, and it's going to put the same color back on the eyes. And so it'll sit there and loop forever until finally the battery runs out. Something else that we'll point out is at the end of every statement, this is called a statement, at the end of every statement, you've got to have this semicolon. That's one of the rules of C. You have to have a semicolon at the end, otherwise the compiler will get upset at you. If you'll notice, there's not a semicolon up here where you open up the curly to the function because the opening of the function is not actually a statement. I know that's all confusing, but the geniuses that made the C language, that's how they figured it out. So let's go ahead and click verify and see if this code compiles. It says compiling, done compiling, that's what you want to see. 
and you can see some stats as far as how much program space you've used. You use about 20% of the program space right now, and that's because um, some of these other background functions got compiled in. But you've got an awful lot more space that you can still use. Now, let's assume that we made a mistake. If you try to program in C for more than about 10 minutes, this is the mistake that you'll probably make. So we're going to leave that semicolon off of there, and we're going to go ahead and click verify and see what happens. Oh, there's red everywhere. So usually the compiler does a pretty good job of letting you know where the mistake was. Now, if you'll notice, it's highlighted this particular line right here, and it's saying this is your problem line right here. But what you have to know is that's usually going to show the line after the line that the mistake was actually on. So don't get fixated on the line that it highlighted. A lot of times if you look to the previous line, you're going to realize that that's your problem right there. And if you go down and look at the notes that it gave you, um, it, it is kind of cryptic what it says. But it says uh, Ringo base sketch 05 INO, which is this tab that we're in, in the function void loop, which is the function that we're in. And that's going to tell you what the error was. Ringo base sketch 05, that's line 44 by the way, and the error, expected a semicolon before on eyes. So that's giving you your clue right there. You see the semicolon, that means you probably lost a semicolon someplace. And so you go in here, you start looking around where it threw the error, and sure enough, oh, I realized that I forgot my semicolon right there. So you put that back in there, verify it again, and now you're happy. Another thing I'll point out is that uh, the C language is case sensitive. So that means that your uppercase letters and your lowercase letters have to be correct. Um, also your spacings between letters, um, if there is a function that has an underscore in it, for example, it has to be an underscore and not a dash. Um, that's not very common in functions. Normally functions are written like this. But let's go ahead and say that we forgot to capitalize our E here. And so we're going to go ahead and verify again. Oh, we've got orange again. On eyes was not declared in this scope. So you're going to go look at your errors again, and the errors in the loop function, which we expect, and uh, the error is that on eyes was not declared in this scope. Now, don't worry about the word scope right now, but it basically is saying uh, the compiler moved through here and it went to on eyes with a lowercase e, and it went and looked through all these tabs back here and it dug through them all while it was compiling and it said, hey, I can't find a function with that name. There's a function with this name, but it's not smart enough to figure that out. So it's going to say, hey, I just can't find the function, and so it just errors out right there. If you do get errors saying that a function wasn't declared, then go ahead and check your spelling, uh, check your capitalization. Uh, I tend to type really quick, and often it's like I'll have an extra character in there or something, and it looks the same when you're looking at it with your eyes, but you keep, you keep, you try it and try it, and it's just not working, and you really get to staring at it, and finally you're like, oh, I misspelled the thing. And then a lot of times it'll work out better for you. So there you go, there's the base sketch. You can go ahead and start changing this up and do whatever you want with it. Go ahead and play with the timings, you'll make the lights flash faster. You can change the colors of the eyes and see what effect that has. You can add more uh, transitions to the list if you like. So you can go ahead and copy this out and we'll do, we'll add two more. And in this one, I'll just make this one red with nothing else. And then I'll make this one green with nothing else. So then it's going to go from kind of a cyan to a purple to red to green. This is also a good time to add comments if you're going to go back and look at this later on because you might forget what color this is. So you might want to say something, for example, uh, we know that uh, red and blue make purple. So you might put the comment here, purple. And we know that 100 with nothing else behind it is going to be just red, red, and this is green. And so you might save that, upload it to your Ringo and see what happens. You can also delete this all out of here and you can add in other functions. I would suggest that you have a look at the Ringo guide and start going through that. That's going to show you how to make all the different lights come on uh, in any kind of pattern that you want, uh, how to turn the lights off, how to turn the motors on, how to make the chirps, um, that sort of thing. So you can just kind of have a little fun uh, being creative here. So you could add in, for example, play chirp. And you'll have to go check out the, uh, the guide to see how that works, but that's what's going to make a tone out of Little Chirper. That's all for the first lesson. Hopefully that gets you started in the right direction. Check back for more later, and we'll continue where we left off. Thanks for watching. Bye.